for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, God. Lord, as we enter into this time of season of this year, God, Lord, with a thankful heart, a heart of gratitude, God. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for coming, Lord, to this earth to be born in a stable. God, they had no room in the end, but they saw fit, Lord, for a birth to happen that night, for a glorious moment, God, for that perfect love to come, Lord, to dwell among us. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we just lift our hand right now and usher in the presence of the Lord? Come on. Hallelujah. Feeling a little scattered this morning. Jesus. Focus our minds, God. Every hand, every heart in tune with the Lord right now. I love you, Jesus. I'm so thankful, God, for your presence. So thankful for a freedom, God, to worship Jesus. Where chains can be broken. Where bondages can be set free, God. Lord, let us never, God, take advantage of your grace, of your mercy, God. We stand among the presence of God with our hearts so silent, God. Oh, we want to worship you. We praise your name. We praise your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. Though the rains fall, Jesus, and the storms begin to rage, you are speaking. You calm the wind and rain. When the night falls, I carry burdens too. Grace is reaching for me. On the cross you have won. It is finished.
this morning a little special song about that perfect love that he raised the dead and he brought new life. So thankful this morning, Jesus. Hallelujah.
praise and glory here right now. Come on, he's the great I am. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Mary, did you know, Mary? In the name of Jesus. Precious name of Jesus. What a powerful, powerful message. As we begin this entering into the Christmas season, what a powerful message of who that little baby in the manger really was. I don't know and fairly confident that maybe God guided the hand of the author of that song because I don't even know that he realized what he wrote when he pinned down the words because as far as I know at least till last I heard he doesn't necessarily understand the Godhead but he wrote down and as he penned those words and I don't know if you caught it or not Mary when you've kissed that little baby You've kissed the face of God. I don't want to get too far ahead yet this morning, but please tell me, when the scripture says that God is a spirit, you can't see a spirit. So she couldn't have kissed a spirit, but he robed himself in flesh and laid in that manger. Come on. When you kiss that little baby, you kiss the very face of God. Mary, did you know the great I am? He laid in that manger. Jesus, precious name. Wow. What a revelation in Jesus' name. I want you just to pray with us here this morning as we begin. Ask God to touch us here today. Thank our praise team. I I tossed that on them just this week and asked them if they could sing that song and what a tremendous job they did. Thank you so very, very much. But let's pray and ask the Lord to help us here today. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you, Lord, for the revelation, God, of who you are. God, I feel your anointing in this room. God, what the enemy may have tried to cause in distraction, God, you have busted through these doors. God, your presence has moved into this room. And God, we surrender every part of our being to you. God, we surrender every part of who we are to you today. God, I surrender my lips, Lord, to speak your anointed word. God, I pray, Lord, that we surrender our ears, Lord, to hear your word. God, surrender our hearts and our spirits, Lord, to receive it. God, in the precious name, the name that's above every name, we pray right now, Lord, that you will touch us in this room for the next few minutes. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In the precious name of Jesus. And why don't you clap your hands to the Lord one more time. You'll just remain standing just a moment and grab your Bibles. Just one verse of scripture. But as we are entering this Christmas season, there is a scripture in Isaiah chapter 9 that I want to read to you here this morning. But as we enter this season, it happens every time it seems the hustle and bustle begins. December 1st happens and it just gets crazy. Uh, We talk about uh, this being the season where we're seeking after peace on earth, but it seems like things get more chaotic. With Christmas gatherings for family and work and school and church and the pressures of decorating and giving and uh, uh, gift giving and baking and shopping. Now, it doesn't matter to me how big the pressure of baking is. Please do all you can to continue to work under that extreme pressure of baking. (laughs) End of the year pressures to meet deadlines at work and if you're in school or in college, the dreaded finals that take place this time of the year. It's supposed to be a time of peace, but it seems to be a time of chaos. So I hope to offer, if I can, over the next several weeks, an oasis from all of this each month Uh, Each week this month as we discuss different parts of a scripture of proclamation that was the beginning for this very season. It was a promise made in a very difficult time 
But in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I want you to just lay your Bibles down, and as you're seated this morning, clap your hands to the Lord one more time. Thank Him. Thank Him for that. As we enter this season, at the forefront of the beginning of this season, there's always been, uh, or we should, uh, the forefront of this season, we should always have that day in mind over 2,000 years ago when there was a child that was born in a manger. It was no ordinary child. He came in a very immaculate way, but without the pomp and circumstance that a child of this nature should have had. A prophecy of a child to be born, of a son that was going to be given, was something that everyone was familiar with and were anticipating the arrival of. They had heard it for years. The problem was with such a grand proclamation They were looking in palaces and they were looking for him to show up in kingdoms. They were looking in these grand uh, areas and avenues that this king, this child should be born. No one was looking in a manger, in a stable, resting with the rest of the farm animals. Nobody expected it. And when you read the full context of the verses in Isaiah 9, it seems very down and very depressing. And then all of the sudden, the prophet puts this verse in there and you see this grand proclamation of a child. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse number 1, it says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and in the land of Naphtali and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in the Galilee of nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied, watch this, the nation and, ha- and not increased the joy. The joy before thee according to the joy in the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, that That kingdom has grown, but the joy has not grown. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Just listen to all of that that's just said in those verses. And then all of the sudden, the prophet says, but I got to tell you something. In the midst of all of this, let me just tell you something. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name's going to be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And then he goes on to say, of his, the increase of his government and peace, I want you to know that there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Man, it just almost seems out of place. All of the other things that are being talked about, and then he makes this grand proclamation of this child that's going to be born and this son that's going to be given so the question this morning then would have to be who is this child who is this child Who is this child to be born, this son to be given that seems to be the answer to the lack of joy, to the darkness that was present, to the battles and the bloodshed and the burdens of the day? Who is this child? Who is this grand gift that when he comes, he's going to have power and authority and peace? Who who is this child that after he comes will bring peace and order and judgment forever? 
The big question, not only at this point in history that we read in the scripture, but on this morning as well, the big question is, who is this child? If you could only imagine and take yourself back in time and take yourself back to this point in history and time and they're looking for this Messiah to come. They're looking for this answer that Isaiah has prophesied about. And in the midst of all of the trials and all of the things that are going to be going on and all of the bloodshed, everything that's going to be happening, he says, but listen, I need you to understand there's going to be a baby born. When that baby is born, I promise you he's going to bring everything that's needed. He's going to have all the things that he's the Messiah that is to come. That baby that will be born. Who is this child? I think at times in this season that we're in, we get lost in the process of of, of gift giving and, and gift receiving. And we kind of get lost in especially the receiving process. <laughs> Our joy for the season, let me just get real where we live for just a second. Sometimes it seems as if our joy for the season is completely dependent on the gifts we receive. And it's not just our children. We sometimes give, now, not here, of course, but in other places. We give on the basis of what we expect to receive. And so it seems as though we've based all of this stuff and all this season, we get into this whole receiving process of things. It was a, a, a most generous Christmas bonus that had ever happened. And if any of you wanted to work for this company, I'm sure um, they probably have very few uh, openings, but for a third year running, and I'm not sure the date this was given, but for the third year running, Fortune Magazine has named Hill Corp as one of the 100 best companies to work for. This year, they certainly proved themselves, they said, worthy of an award by, by giving each of their 1,380 employees, watch, a $100,000 Christmas bonus. Anybody want to go to Hill Court and work? <laughs> a bonus, Christmas bonus of $100,000 for each of the 1,380 employees. Quickly do the math and you realize that number. 100000 per employee. Listen, regardless of their position in the company. So the CEO got the same bonus as the janitor. One hundred thousand. I got anybody's attention yet? And it, it, here's the thing: it's not the first time that Hill Corp has done this uh, and offered these extravagant bonuses. Just a few years earlier, they offered each employee the choice of a fifty thousand dollar car or thirty five thousand dollars in cash. So after, after that happened, you can only imagine how the employees maybe treated the company at that point. And, and so it's probably not going to be their last time. But the recipients, watch this, this is in the interview that was done. The recipients seem to be truly grateful. <laughs> they said this, the, the lady that they were talking to, this is a receptionist. Uh, they, she said this, she said, it's just a true gift. <laughs> and I think myself, along with everyone else, is going to, to not going to give less than 100% each day. You think? <laughs> We're going to give 100%. 1% for every money, that, 100, every 100,000 they give us, or, or every 1,000, 10,000 they give us. We're going to give 1%. $100,000 bonus how many would you be willing to give the company 100 <laughs> percent? because if they've done 35,000 or a 55 a 50 thousand dollar car before and now they've done a hundred thousand how hard you gonna work they said they felt like every employee should share in the benefits of the profits of the company that's a pretty extreme gift 
See, their, their generosity, as the, as the person said, really was a true gift. But when we look at all of this and we look at the season we're in, what about, if you really want to look about the, the original Christmas bonus program? The very first one that was given 2,000 plus years ago when, as we mentioned, God presented himself uh, to all mankind, the truest really of all gifts. He came to live for us and to die for us so that he could offer us a bonus of all bonuses and that's the opportunity at eternal life. And he offered it equally to each one of us. Remember, regardless of our position, our rank, or our status. The employees of Hillcorp can be so motivated by $100,000 to give 100% each and every day back to the company. How much more should we give back the service and gratitude of the one who gave it all. I, I, guess, I guess when you're getting a $100,000 bonus, it's pretty easy to say, I'll give 100%. That makes it pretty easy. But I, I want to ask you this question this morning. How much value would you put on a child being born in a manger? How much value would you put on that? How much value does it have? It, it, it's, not, it's not just a good story. I, I hope that you understand that. And before I finish here in the next few minutes this morning, I hope you understand. It's not just a good story. It's a revelation that will absolutely change your life. $100,000 might change your life for a season. But the revelation of what happened in a manger, in a stable somewhere, is something that is going to make surely change your entire life forever. It's the bonus of all bonuses. The revelation that took place. It's not just a good story. It's, it's more than just a, a Christmas time message. But it is a proclamation that will ring true with power and authority to everyone who believes it. And for all of eternity. Not just a season. It's not just a month we take out of the year. It's not just a day we celebrate out of the year. But the revelation of who was born in that manger. The revelation of who that child really is. Is something that will give back for eternity to everyone who believes it in all reality it's a message that will get you out of this world when the trumpet sounds at the rapture that hundred thousand dollars ain't gonna do anything for you when the trumpet sounds when the rapture takes place and the trumpet sounds, that money's not going to do you anything. The prestige is not going to do you anything. What you have and who you know is not going to matter one bit when the trumpet sounds. But the revelation of who this child is, I promise you, is what will lift you out of this world. It's what's going to take you on into eternity. It is the most valuable gift of all. The understanding of who is this child. Who is this child? child's more than just another baby he is the very god of heaven that has come to earth well how do you know that to be true pastor how do you know it's not just a good story well i'm glad you asked first i need to establish something in this room before i can go any further i need to establish something this morning how many of you believe that the child that was born the son that was given was jesus I just need to see a show of hands across the room because I, I got to make this assessment before I do this. Okay, then let me show you the Old, Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah being revealed in the New Testament. Because this, this scripture that we use, Isaiah 9 and 6, I hope you realize that's Old Testament. That's an Old Testament prophecy. There's some people that say the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. We're a New Testament church. But I promise you the Old Testament matters. And there's a proclamation that's been made in the Old Testament that you better know matters in my life. And so if we all agree that that baby in Isaiah 9 and 6, that child that was born, that son that was given was Jesus, then let me show you a revelation from that prophecy in Old Testament to how he's revealed in the New Testament. So let me read it to you one more time. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now, let me just kind of go through a little bit of scripture with you this morning. They sang a song that said that when you've kissed the face 
of your baby, you've kissed the face of God. When you are holding this baby, you're holding the great I am. They mentioned all of these things in the song. And so that's a revelation of scripture in the New Testament. Because let me just kind of walk with you a little bit in some scripture. Let me show you Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. This same scenario, that prophecy that was given of that child to be born. Here it comes. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Are we talking about the same baby? Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. A child will be born, a a son will be given. You're going to bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted means God with us. Same baby, right? We haven't switched babies on you yet. Same baby. Let's look at... Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1 because how do you know that that's really God how do you know that when she kissed the face of her baby she's kissing the face of God how do you know that well let me help you John 1 and 1 in the beginning was the and the word was with God and the word the word was God everybody see that if you don't believe me open your own Bible see if it's in your Bible make sure we didn't switch the words on the screen with you it says the word was who Then if you skip down to verse number 14, it says this. And the word. Who is the word? So could you easily say, and God became. And the word was made flesh. The word was who? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Are we still talking about the same baby? Same revelation, same thing that's taken place. Then you skip down to verse number 18, and you have to understand how do we know for sure that's who that baby is, and, and how do we know the words of the song are right when they said that when you've kissed the face of your baby, you've kissed the face of God, because here's what you have to understand. John 1 and 18 says, no man has seen God at any time. I think it's not, it's not misusing the scripture in any way to say no man or woman has seen God at any time. This is a revelation in the New Testament. So if it were actual the Spirit of God, which we said, you know, we, we understand that you, nobody's seen God. So Mary couldn't have seen God. So what did Mary have to see in that, in that manger? She had to see the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, that He hath declared Him. Well, how do you know it wasn't God? Because verse number 24 of chapter 4 of John says, God is a spirit. (laughs) You can't see a spirit. So that spirit, God was the word. The word was made flesh. The same proclamation that was given in Isaiah 9 and 6, that there was going to be a child born and a son given, is the same son that was born to the Virgin Mary, who said, I'm going to have call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, which is the same thing John's talking about when he said the word was made flesh, God was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's all one and the same. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 says this, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And he took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If he has all power and all authority, and if everything is going to bow down to him, it's not possible that there would be more than one of him because there can only be one. Because everything else is bowing down to him. But let me read it to you in the New Living Translation. Just just watch what this says. Same scriptures, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of the equality with God as something to cling to. That's why he was born in a manger, in a stable, and not some grand pomp and circumstance somewhere. 
He said, verse 7, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was with God and the word was. God is a spirit. That spirit was made flesh and dwelt among us. Here it's telling us when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is God. Why is this so important? I'm telling you the revelation that took place of who is this child is something so powerful in your life that when you grab a hold of it, it's something that will carry you out of this world when the rapture takes place, whether you're in the grave or whether you're still walking on the earth. The revelation of who Jesus really is is what's going to save you. It is the greatest gift and bonus you could ever receive. Who is this child? John, John writes down, let me just give you a couple other scriptures. John says in 17 uh, verses 20 to 22, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, Jesus speaking, but for them also which shall believe on me through the word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I am in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are So, let me just pull it in one more time. Let's look one more time. Everybody still with me? The baby born in the manger. The child they were talking about, Isaiah 9 and 6. The same one they talked about was going to be born of a virgin, right? We're still on the same page, same child. Okay? Luke chapter 1 verse 31 says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth what? And you shall call his name... Is this a different baby than we just talked about earlier? Or is it the same one? When they said Emmanuel, which means God with us, they said you're going to call him Jesus. Same baby? Or not same baby? Did we make a switch? <laughs> same baby from Isaiah 9 and 6 all the way through the scripture where we are now in Luke. Bring forth the son, shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great. And he shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord of God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Anybody remember what I read in Isaiah 9 and verse 7? Of his government and his peace there shall be no end. Same baby we're talking about. Then Mary replies to the angel, How shall this thing be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered then and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. But he is the one true God that is in that manger every scripture and I could give you a whole lot more better yet go back and watch the dual nature series and you'll hear all of it but that one baby that was born why is it so important that we start there why is it so important that over the next several weeks everything else that we're going to talk about that, that has to do with, with this scripture Isaiah 9 and 6 why is it so important that the foundation is laid down on the baby that was born in this manger was not just a child it was not just some other baby it was God himself robed in flesh come to dwell among us why is that so vitally important because if you don't believe that statement the rest of it doesn't matter none of the rest of it even has a place none of the rest of it even matters if you don't believe that first foundational principle that the child that was born the son that was given was not just some baby but it was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me help you a little bit. Let me put it to you this way. As a child, he was flesh. But as God, he was spirit. As a child, he was the least. 
but as God, he was the greatest. As a child, he couldn't speak his first words, but as God, he'll have the final word. As a child, he was helpless and depended on others, but as God, he came to save all and wants you to depend upon him. As a child, he was weak, but as God, he is strong. As, it was, as a child, he was a gift, but as God, he was a sacrifice. As a child, he had a beginning. He was the begotten one, but as God, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the ending. Who is this child? As a child, he was subject to others. But as God, he is the ultimate authority. As a child, he was loved. But as God, he is love. Why is it important that I know who this child is? Because as a child, he needed things. But as God, he is my supplier. As a child, he was subject to sickness. But as God, he is my healer. As a child, he needed protection. But as God, he was my protector. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to tell you just yet. As a child, he would cry. But as God, he's going to wipe away every tear. As a child, he needed food. But as God, he's the bread of life. As a child, he needed water. But as God, he is a well of water springing up on the inside of us. As a child, he was thirsty. But as God, he said, with me, you'll never thirst again. Who is this child? Come on, somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Who is this child? Who is this child? As a child, he was confined to a manger. But as God, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time. As a child, he was bound by time. As God, a day is as a thousand years. As a child, he was born into a sinful world. But as God, he's come to take away the sins of the world. As a child, he was increased in wisdom. But as God, he knows the very intent of your heart. As God, as a child, he was a creator. Creation, but as God, He is the Creator. As a child, He had a peasant's beginning, but as God, He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As a child, He might get lost, but as God, He has the way, the truth, and the life. Let me just settle it with this one right here. He was born of us so He could rescue us. Maybe you didn't grab a hold of that last statement. Let me just tell you something. The reason he came was to be born just like you and just like me and be tempted just like we are so that we would understand he came and was born like us simply to rescue us. Why is it so important we understand who is this child? Music can get ready. This, this child was the answer. Let me just kind of boil it all down for you. He was born of us to rescue us. But this child is the answer to a broken relationship that was brought about by sin of Adam and Eve. That's really what this child is. <laughs> It couldn't have been a better song for them to sing this morning earlier when they sang perfect love because the real example of perfect love was a child that was born in a manger to take care of the problem that we had of sin that was caused by human beings. The perfect display of love happened in a manger. 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 says this, For as in Adam all die. Because there was a break in relationship because of sin. But then it goes on to say, the second Adam, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Let me kind of walk you through this for just a moment as I close here this morning, in the next few minutes. Just, just listen to me this morning. The relationship that man had with his creator had been undermined by evil that had entered the world. The true reason that the Lord of heaven came 
to a manger to be born of a virgin was to reestablish the opportunity for mankind to once again have an intimate relationship with him. That was the reason. He thought so much, please hear me, he thought so much of you that he did not send someone else. But he came himself to redeem you back to him. Please hear what I just told you. He thought so much about you. Because we can't talk about perfect love if we're sending a secondary person to do the job. How much do I really love you? Let me put it to you this way. If somebody's going to come into my home and try to hurt my family, or they put a gun to my wife's head, and I look at them and say, I, you know, I would go stand over in front of that bullet, but I'm going to send somebody else to go do that for me because I love her that much. Does any of that make sense? What you're going to do, I would hope, <laughs> is I'm going to do everything I can to get in front of that bullet because I don't want anything to happen to her because I love her. Guess what? God loved you so much that he robed himself in flesh. He didn't send somebody else. He didn't send a junior Jehovah. He didn't send a second God in the Trinity. He didn't send somebody else. He came himself because he loved you so much. He said, I am so hurt by the breakup of our relationship that I'm not going to send somebody else to fix it. I'm going to come fix it myself. It's not like when you were in high school and you had a disgruntlement with the girl you were liking or the boy you were liking and you sent a note by or sent somebody else to deliver the note. God said, I'm so hurt by the breakup of our relationship that I'm not going to send anybody else with a message other than myself. I'm going to show up myself and rekindle this relationship. I'm going to give them an opportunity because I love them so much. I'm going to come myself. See, what you have to understand is it doesn't matter your mistakes. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter whether you feel worthy or not. The child was not born for a specific group. He was born for us. For unto a child is born and unto it didn't have a category of who can get it and who can't. It didn't have a category of who can have relationship and who can't. He said, I'm coming and I'm being born in a manger simply because I want to recreate the opportunity for you to have a relationship with me like we've never had before. That means that when no one else loved you, he loved you. That means when no one else cares for you, He'll care for you. Stand with me. So let me ask you this question once again. Who is this child? Who is this child? Let me just tell you who he is this morning. He's the answer to your hurt, he's the answer to your pain. He's the answer to your sorrows. He's the answer to your sickness. Who is this child? He's the one that in a manger brought joy and peace and healing and power. Who is this child? Huh. He's the one that loves you so much that he sent me here this morning to tell you you don't have to walk in this life alone. But he's given you the opportunity to rekindle that relationship that was lost in a garden. See, by having this opportunity now, once again, you can walk with him daily. You know what was lost when sin entered? Adam and Eve lost the relationship that they had with God. Because in the cool of the evening presence of God would come and walk with them the presence of God would come and commune with them and the presence of God would be with them in that cool of the evening every day they had that opportunity to walk with God and to talk with God 
Because of sin, that relationship was severed. But he said, I got an answer for that. And a prophet Isaiah said, you know what? Here's what's going to happen. In the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the struggle, in the midst of all the battling, in the midst of all the hurt and heartache, in the midst of all the lack of joy, how, how profound that if you look at what Isaiah said and you look at where we are right now, he said, your government's going to increase. Your kingdom's going to increase. There's no joy. How many of you know people right now that have all that they could possibly want, but they got no joy? Suicides happen because people can't find joy. I'll never forget the morning in high school when they came over the speaker and said, we're going to have a moment of silence for Donnie Griffin. Donnie Griffin was a friend of mine in high school. We were juniors in high school when this happened. I'll never forget it, the announcement over the radio. Donnie Griffin was the popular kid. He was the one that had everything. Family had money, had everything you could possibly want. Or at least it seemed that way, that everything was increased and he had everything that had grown, but there was something missing. Because one afternoon after school, Donnie went home and got in the safe and got his daddy's gun and put a bullet to his head. So isn't it profound that Isaiah's prophecy, that when all this is going to be taking place, there is an answer. And when he says all of that that's going on and the lack of joy and the bloodshed and all those things he talked about, the darkness and the burdens and all those things he mentions, anybody feel like that maybe is where we're at today? Anybody feel like maybe that's just kind of where we're at right now? He said, here's what I want you to know. In the hurt of your family, in the pain of the things that are going on around you, in the struggles that you may have, in the situations that you may be battling, in the things that may be going on, here's what I want you to understand. There is an, a there is an answer. And the answer is found in a manger. Because he said, in the midst of all of this, here's the first principle I want you to understand. That unto us, a child is born. And unto us, the Son is given. And we're going to spend the next several weeks and we're going to cover other aspects of that scripture. But the first principle you need to grab a hold of is who is this child? Because I'm just going to tell you as plainly as I can this morning, if he was just some child, if he was just a secondary in a trinity, or if he was just something other than who he was, the rest of it really doesn't make any sense. Because how can that child be the mighty God? How can that child be the everlasting Father? How can that child be the Prince of Peace? How can that child be the God that I need to walk with day in and day out? The reason that child is that is because he was God. Mary, when you kissed your baby, you kiss the face of God. Once again, you have an opportunity to walk with Him and to talk with Him daily. So I ask you as you bow your heads this morning, why don't you do that today? Why don't you take advantage of that today? Why don't you put the rat race on hold for just a moment and spend some time with Him? Because that's what he longs for. It's really what you need. But it's what he longs for. And so I understand this is maybe preaching a message off of a Christmas scripture. If that's what you want to classify it. But in all reality, this is a message to you to tell you, you don't have to go through the pain. And you don't have to go through the struggle. And you don't have to go through the trials and the sickness. And you don't have to go through the things you're facing by yourself. 
because there was a child that was born there was a son that was given and it wasn't just some baby somewhere it was the king of kings and it was the lord of lords it was your creator it was your healer it was your redeemer it was your savior it's the one you're looking for so why not this morning do we not create that atmosphere one more time why not this morning do you just take a few minutes and reconnect in that relationship with him he said I desire to have a relationship with you and I desire it so much so so much so that I've robed myself in flesh I was born as one of you to simply rescue you as they begin to sing I want to open this altar this morning invite you to come maybe it's an opportunity just to talk to God once again and maybe reestablish a relationship this morning why is it so important I know who this child is it's vitally important I could get into other scriptures that says if you don't know that I am he you'll die in your sins it's vitally important that I know who this child is so I open this altar to you this morning why don't you come maybe you want to just say God reveal yourself to me once again God show yourself to me once again God renew and refresh and rekindle God that spirit in me once again I, I need to know what Mary needed to find out and that is who you are that you are the great I am you are the king of kings that baby that was born who is this child He's your Savior, He's your Redeemer, and He's your King. Mary, did you know that your baby 